Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. You know, in the last um, 20 years, scientists have proved a philosopher's dream to be true, and that is the fact that we're all brothers and sisters. And I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean we're all cut from the same genetic cloth. The human genetic endowment is a single continuum. Race has been exposed as an utter fiction. Indeed, studies of the Y chromosome in the male descent line of humanity and mitochondrial DNA in the female descent line of humanity have left no doubt whatsoever that we're all descended from a handful of people who walked out of Africa some 60,000 years ago and then embarked on this extraordinary hegira, 40,000 years in the making, 2,500 human generations that carried the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. But if you accept that we're all cut from the same genetic cloth, you have to accept the fact that all cultures share the same raw genius, the same human potential, the same mental acuity. And whether this genius is invested in the technological wizardry, which has been the great achievement in the West, or by contrast, placed into unraveling the complex threads of memory inherent in a myth, is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no progress in the affairs of culture. There's no ladder to success that runs from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized of the Strand in London. That old Victorian idea that there was a pyramid at the apex of which sat Victorian Europe that sloped down to the so-called primitives of the world has been utterly exposed as an artifact of the 19th century as relevant to our lives today as a notion that clergymen had in that era that the earth was only 6,000 years old. In this stunning affirmation of the human spirit, science has proven the in essential interconnectedness of humanity. And what this means is that the other cultures of the world aren't failed attempts at being you, let alone failed attempts at being modern. Quite to the contrary, each is a fundamental answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the myriad of cultures of the world answer that question, they do so in 7,000 different languages. And those languages collectively become our human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that will confront us as a species in the ensuing millennia. But what do I mean by different cultures making for different manifestations of the human spirit? Let's slip for a moment to the greatest culture sphere ever brought into being by the human imagination, Polynesia. Tens of thousands of islands flung like jewels upon a southern sea. I sailed recently in the Hokulea, a recreated sacred canoe based on the models that were sketched by Joseph Banks in the, his journals as he sailed with Captain Cook in the 18th century. And even today, the sailors of the Polynesian voyaging society can name 300 stars in the night sky. They can identify the presence of distant atolls of islands beyond the visible horizon simply by watching the reverberation of waves across the hull of the vessel, knowing full well that every island in the group of the Pacific has its own unique refractive pattern that can be read with the same perspicacity with which a forensic scientist would read a fingerprint. In the darkness in the hull of the vessels, they can distinguish as many as five different sea swells moving through the canoe at any one point in time, distinguishing those caused by local weather disturbances from the deep currents that pulsate across the ocean and can be followed with the same ease with which a terrestrial explorer would follow a river to the sea. Indeed, if you took all of the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to an understanding of the ocean, what you would get is Polynesian. The most amazing thing is the entire tradition was based on dead reckoning. You only knew where you were by remembering how you got there. And the Polynesians did not have the written word. So over the course of a multi-week journey, the wayfinder had to sit monk-like in the stern of the vessel, remembering every shift of the wind, every sign of the stars, every sign of the sea, the celestial bodies. And it was fear, it was the impossibility of doing this over a long oceanic voyage that kept Europeans hugging the shores of continents, but we know that 10 centuries before Christ, the ancestors of the Polynesians set sail into the rising sun. Now, if you go to the greatest forest sphere, we enter the Amazon, the homeland of the people of the Anaconda, the Barasana, the Makuna, the Tanimukos, who cognitively do not distinguish the color green from the color blue because the canopy of the heavens is equated to the canopy of the rainforest a people who have wisdom traditions that honor the man of knowledge as opposed to the warrior, social structures that facilitate peace, not war, not the least of which is that you must marry someone who speaks a different language. 
And so in any one maloka, you'll have six and seven languages spoken, but you never hear a child reciting a particular language or practicing. They simply listen, wait, watch, and one day begin to speak. And what we've come to understand is that the mythologies of these societies are nothing more or less than a complex land management plan that dictates precisely how human beings in great numbers can live in the Amazon rainforest. These societies are indeed the descendants of the ancient civilizations, which once numbered tens of millions of people in the Amazon. Now slip into the realm of the spirit, into the homeland of Tibet. I recently made a film which we called The Buddhist Science of the Mind. Why would you use the term science for what you think is a religion? Well, what is science but the empirical pursuit of the truth? What is Tibetan Buddhism but 2,500 years of direct empirical observation as to the nature of mind? My good friend Mathieu Ricard began his life as the son of the most illustrious Descartian philosopher in France. His mother was a famous painter. He learned photography from Cartier-Bresson. He was taught piano by Stravinsky. He learned anthropology at the feet of Claude Lévi-Strauss. But one day he realized there was no correlation between fame, wealth, and happiness. He went back to where he had always been happy, Tibet, and became ordained as a monk. He used to say to me, that Western science is too often a major response to minor needs. We spend all of our lifetime trying to live to be 100 without losing our teeth. The Tibetan spends all their lifetime trying to understand the nature of existence. Our billboards, he said, celebrate naked teenagers in underwear. The billboards in Tibet are mani walls, prayers for the well-being of all sentient creatures. And the essence of the Buddhist path, the path that so offended Mao Zedong, the individual who incidentally was responsible for the death of more of his own people in his lifetime than Hitler and Stalin combined, what was it that so offended the Marxist materialists of Beijing? The Four Noble Truths, all life is suffering. By that, it doesn't, the Buddha didn't mean life was negative, he meant shit happens. The second of the Noble Truths was that the cause of suffering was ignorance. That simply meant that, not negation or stupidity, but the tendency of human beings to cling to the illusion, the cruel illusion of their own centrality in the stream of divine existence. The third of the noble truths was a revelation that ignorance could be overcome. And the fourth was the delineation of a contemplative practice that if it followed, not only had the possibility of a transformation of the human heart, but had 2,500 years of empirical evidence to say that that transformation would indeed happen. And so with my good friend Shara Barma, a traditional Amshi doctor who spent one year in solitary retreat in this cave as part of his medical training, and with Mathieu chanting the sutras, we went in pursuit of the true wisdom hero of the East to the slopes of Mount Everest, not to go into a zone of death where oxygen deprivation obliterates consciousness, which for the Tibetan is about the stupidest thing you can possibly do. We went to be in the presence of a wisdom hero, a woman who as a young girl had escaped the clutches of a suitor, crawling down a latrine, covered with excrement, turned up the monastery, became ordained as a nun after she had crossed the mountains into Tibet, came back into this realm, and for 45 years she lived in a cell no larger than this corner of the stage. This is a photograph taken the day the sunlight fell on her face for the first time in 45 years. By the terms of reference of our society, we should have been met by a madwoman. We were met by a woman whose face radiated loving compassion. For the Tibetan, this is the proof of the efficacy of the science of the mind that is a dharma, the serenity achieved by the practitioner. And later that day, a lama in that nunnery uh, adjacent monastery said to me uh, an interesting thing. He said, you know, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. Now, following this anthropological metaphor, let's go into the realm of the sacred, sacred geography. What does it mean to be a people who really believe that the earth is alive, that human beings have reciprocal obligations to it, even as they have obligations to the earth? In the Andes, a young lad is raised not to believe that a mountain is a pile of rock ready to be mined, but that it's an Apu spirit, a deity that will direct his destiny. This is has huge consequences in terms of the relationship between that culture, it's particular, in, in particular its ecological footprint. Now, if we go to the one part of South America never vanquished in a blood-stained continent by the Spanish, we enter the realm of the elder brother, the Arawako and the Kohi, descendants of the ancient Tyrona civilization that carpeted the Caribbean coastal plain of Colombia. In the wake of the conquest, they retreated into an isolated massif, where to this day they're ruled by a ritual priesthood. The acolytes are taken away from the families at the age of two and three, 
sequestered in a shadowy world of darkness for 18 years, during which time they absorb all the Baroque cosmology of the society, including the conviction that their prayers and their prayers alone maintain the cosmic balance. After 18 years, they're led out into the dawn, and for the first time, they see the world as it is, theirs to protect. They go off on a pilgrimage through a sacred landscape where every ripple in the rock resonates with significance. And from the high ice of the mountains to the sea, where the sacred sites are now covered by temples of concrete and, and rebar, they still utter their prayers. They believe that their prayers maintain the cosmic balance. They say that we are the younger brother who have ruined the world. And it's m amazing to think that two hours from Miami Beach, these mamos are praying, as I sit here today, for our collective well-being. Come to the place that was the antith antithesis of the Descartian world of Europe into your own homeland of Australia. When the British first met the Aboriginal people, they saw people who looked strange, who had a simple technology, who, to the offense of the British, had no interest in improving upon their lot. For the British, this was in unconscionable, because, of course, progress, optimism, was the ethos of their age, notions that died in the mud and blood of Flanders, but were very much alive when the British first washed ashore in Australia. And because the Aboriginal people seemed so different, the British, in their inimitable way, concluded they weren't people at all. And in 1902, while my grandfather lived in the city of Melbourne, Australia, it was debated in the parliament as to whether Aboriginal people were human beings at all. But what was missing was the British in ability to understand the subtle devotional philosophy of these first people to walk out of Africa. We know that the Aboriginal people, within 5,000 years, their ancestors came upon this parsimonious continent, and then they went walking, establishing 10,000 clan territories like a matrix, clan territories connected by a single concept, the dreaming. The dreaming wasn't a dream, it was a state of perpetual existence in which past, present, and future fused into one. In not one of the 670 languages and dialects of Australia was there a word for past, present, future, or time. There was only the dreaming. And the entire purpose in life in Australia was the antithesis of progress. It was to do the ritual gestures deemed to be necessary within your clan territory to keep the world exactly as it was at the time of the Rainbow Serpent. It would be as if all the, uh, the efforts in the West, uh, in, all of our in all of our history, had been invested into pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to maintain it just as it was at the time when Adam and Eve had their fateful conversation. The question isn't to say who's right and who's wrong. Had humanity as a whole followed this particular intellectual devotion, yes, we wouldn't have put a man on the moon, but on the other hand, we wouldn't be talking about climate change and our capacity to transform the biological life support systems of the planet. Similarly, when the British first reached my homeland of Canada, they saw people who looked odd, and the Inuit took the British to be gods, the British took the Inuits to be savages, both were wrong, one did more to honor the human race. And what the British failed to understand was that there was no better measure of genius than the ability to survive in that harsh environment on a technology that was limited to what you could forge from the cold. The Inuit didn't fear the cold, they took advantage of it. The runners of their sleds were originally made of fish, three Arctic char laid in a row and wrapped in the skin of a caribou hide. The Inuit didn't fear the cold, they took advantage of it. For them, blood on ice was not the sign of death, but an affirmation of life itself. And when the British mimicked their ways, they achieved great feats of exploration. When they failed to do so, they suffered terrible deaths. When the last of Lord Franklin's men were found frozen to death at Starvation Cove on the Adelaide Peninsula, the young sailors were dragging behind them a sled made of oak and iron built in Manchester, England, that weighed 500 pounds. On top of it was a dory from Franklin's ship that weighed 300 pounds. Inside the dory were all the accoutrements of a British naval officer's dinner service, including silver plate and a copy of the novel, The Vicar of Wakefield. This they expected to drag through the immense reaches of northern Canada, hoping to bump into a Hudson Bay post and achieve salvation. Well, of course, they suffered terrible deaths, but the Inuit moved lightly on the land, Cold for them is something to be taken advantage of. When I took this photograph, I was polar bear hunting. That night, the temperature dropped to minus 65 Celsius before the wind came up. We simply made an igloo, got into the robes, got the oil lamps going, and ate raw meat. 
I was narwhal hunting at the tip of Baffin Island uh, when I recorded a wonderful story from Olayek. Uh, during the 1950s, a dark period of Canadian history, we forced the Inuit into settlements uh, to establish our own sovereignty in an archipelago that could have gone back to the Europeans. This man's grandfather categorically refused to go into the settlements, so the family, fearful of, for his life, took away of his weapons, his tools, thinking that would oblige him to settle down. Did it? No. In the middle of an Arctic night, the old man slipped outside of the igloo, pulled down his caribou hide trousers, and defecated into his hand. And as the feces began to freeze, he shaped it in the form of an implement. And when the implement, forged by the cold from human waste, took final form, he put a spray of saliva along the leading edge and used the implement as a knife to kill a dog. He skinned the dog, improvised the traces of a sled with the skin of the dead dog, improvised the sled from the ribcage of the dead dog, and then harnessing up an adjacent living dog and shit knife in belt, disappeared in the Arctic night. Now talk about getting by with nothing. And that is a kind of a symbol of the resilience of this culture. Even the way the Inuit people think is informed by the ebb and flow of ice. They are people of the ice, but the ice is melting. This is a photograph I took at the northernmost community in the world of Connacht, northwest Greenland, when the ice used to come in in September and stay till July. Now it comes in in November and is gone by March. Their world is literally, literally melting from beneath them. So why, why do any of these cultures matter? You know, we have this notion that, quaint and colorful though they may be, they're somehow destined to fade away as if by natural law, as if their failed attempts at being modern, failed attempts at being us. Nothing could be further from the truth. Change is no threat to culture. All cultures are always dancing with new possibilities for life. Technology is no threat to culture, but power is. In every case, these are dynamic living peoples being driven out of existence by external forces. And that's actually an optimistic observation because it suggests if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. But we better get on with it. Because of the 7,000 languages spoken in the world the day that you were born, today fully half aren't being whispered into the ears of infants. Now, a language isn't just vocabulary and grammar. A language is a flash of the human spirit. Every language is an old-growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And every two weeks, somewhere on the planet, an elder dies and carries with him or her into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. And what this means is that this entire body of knowledge, which I've just begun to give you a sense of, half of it is slipping away within our lifetimes. And this does not have to happen. Why are these cultures so important? In part because they tell us that there are, there are other options, other ways of being, other visions of life itself. And they put the lie to those who say we cannot change as we know we must change the fundamental way in which we inhabit this planet. Culture is not trivial. It's not decorative. It's the body of ethical and moral values that we place around each individual to keep at bay the barbaric heart that history teaches us lies within each human being. It is culture that allows us to make sense of sensation, to find order and meaning in a universe that may have none, to always reach for the better angel of our nature. And so if you want to know what happens when culture is lost, look around the world to the points of chaos. The issue isn't the traditional versus the modern, how do we find ways for all peoples to benefit from the genius of modernity without that engagement demanding the death of who they are? How do we find a way that all peoples in all gardens continue to flourish even as we move in this truly polychromatic world of diversity in which every culture and every voice has a place at the Council of Human Wisdom and Knowledge? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike.